Welcome to part two of the PDHPE lecture series. So we ended part one with CVD. So the next part we're going to cover is cancer. We're going to do this by going through a question um, from the 2011 paper, question 21b. So this was worth seven marks. The question was, what are the determinants of these cancers, so breast and lung cancer, and why do they put some groups um, at more risk than the general population? So, um, what? So it's asking you to identify the determinants, um, and then why. So that means explain to show, show cause and effect, and to get those seven marks, um, I would recommend giving about three to four examples. So... So this is how I would go about answering the question. Um, I talked about sociocultural determinants, so that's why I've put that in red. Um, the bits in blue are the cause, so the risk factor itself, and the green is um, what it does, so the effect. So sociocultural determinants are factors related to family, peers, religion, or the media that affect health. For instance, hereditary. This means that people with a family history of breast or lung cancer may have a genetic disposition to cancer, increasing their chances of developing it. Women giving birth at, um, at a later stage in life is another sociocultural risk factor of breast cancer. This has been the result of social change in which more women have joined the workforce, thus delaying the stage at which they begin, their, um, begin to have their families and children. Additionally, people who have family or friends who smoke are at greater risk of developing lung cancer as a result of a smoking habit or passive smoking. So as, as you can see there in that short paragraph, um, you know, I've given three examples already. So it's really, it's, um, it's good to show how much you can fit in a little um, bit of space. So this is about sociocultural. Um, and a continuation of that answer, um, I talk about socioeconomic determinants. So um, this is associated with education, income and employment. Um, and people with a low socioeconomic background may lack the education and knowledge about the risk factors of breast cancer and lung cancer. As a consequence, they may unknowingly participate in activities or habits such as physical inactivity, inactivity, or exposure to tobacco smoke that increase their risk of developing breast or lung cancer. Additionally, people who receive a low income may purchase fast food, which are high in fat because they are a cheaper option. However, a high fat diet is a, um, is a risk factor for breast cancer. So as you can see in those two slides, um, that's one way um, that you could approach a question like this in the HSC. So before we end this focus question um, in core one, I'm just going to go through a few more multiple choice questions that you can use to study right now. So from 2015, which of the following best defines the process of metastasis? going to let you read through those answers. Feel free to pause the video now and I'll reveal the answer very soon. And so we have C. So metastasis is malignant cells invading body tissues or organs. So this, you might think like, what is metastasis? Like when I did my HSC, I got this question and I was like, what on earth? Um, a lot of people got this question wrong, actually. The way I ended up getting this question right is that I um, process of elimination. So, you know, if you don't know um, what the question could be, just kind of go by that to see what it could not be. Um, and my guess was right and it was C. So, you know, if you have completely no idea, process of elimination, get rid of the ones you definitely know are, um, are the wrong answers and then just try to go from there. But yeah, so, you know, the, they can get really specific in the multiple choice questions as well. Then we've got question 
8 from 2012. Um, which of the following diseases is now three times more prevalent than it was 20 years ago in Australia? And the answer to that question is B, diabetes. So you might think this is a really mean question. It's not even in um, the syllabus, but it kind of is. So um, you do have to do a little bit of research. You know, if you don't know trends in certain diseases, um, really valuable to have a look at some of the questions from past HSC papers um, on that. Um, you know, you don't have to know, like, as I said earlier, you don't need to know a great, 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 great deal about it, but you do know you do need to know some trends. So for this, the reason why um, it was it was obviously diabetes is because the core is all about um, these priority health issues um, that usually result from uh, life, like they're usually lifestyle diseases, and the lifestyle disease there is diabetes. So some something that is um, quite easily preventable. Um, and as you would know, um, throughout the year, you've probably learned that um, people have been engaging in more sedentary um, lifestyles. So, you know, they're not going out as much and the population is um, eating a lot more unhealthy food. All right. So that's the end of focus question two. Um, we're going to move now to focus question three. And we're going to start off with a multiple choice question. Um, so it's about healthy aging. So what um, is healthy aging? So l I'll let you pause the video now and I'll show you the answer soon. And it's B. Um, healthy aging refers to the behaviours and activities that can contribute to quality of life for elderly people. All right. So you know, that could be a definition that you use that can help you study um, when talking about healthy aging or kind of to gather your thoughts when they ask you a question about it. Another one is from 2012. Who has the primary responsibility pro um, for providing healthcare services such as public hospitals and mental health facilities? Pause the video now. And that's right, a state government. So you should know this. Um, one of the parts that you need to know is the responsibility of each level of government. And the state is responsible for the provision of public hospitals and mental health facilities. Um, the federal government is usually responsible for taxi, um, for taxing, which creates revenue and provide funding for these health services. And local governments, they're, they're more... Um, working closely with their community um, and local governments do um, things like uh, waste disposal, um, ensuring the hygiene in public bathrooms and all that kind of stuff. Um, the next part we're going to cover is about Medicare for Australian citizens. Um, so you should note the advantages and disadvantages of Medicare, as well as the advantages and disadvantages of the private health, um, of private health insurance. So this one's a really basic one. Just you know, give the basic features of why Medicare is good. And this is how I would go about answering the question. I've highlighted in green um, the kind of the really important um, points that you should know for this question. So Medicare. Australia's public health care system provides equitable health care services and facilities for all Australian citizens and its residents. It is funded through income taxes, whereby the amount paid is in proportion to the individual or family's income level. This promotes equity. Through this, all Australians have access to free treatment in public hospitals, most general practitioners, and subsidises some ancillary services. You know, and that's all you need for um, a three marker. And this part of the syllabus, health expenditure versus expenditure on early intervention and prevention. This pretty this concept pretty much underpins all of core one. This is what it's all about. Um, it's kind of trying to convince you, trying to argue the point that prevention is better than cure. We want um, health expenditure to kind of... Um, we want expenditure on health 
to shift towards early intervention and prevention. So wouldn't you rather prevent the illness from happening rather than actually having to cure it, if that makes sense? Um, you'd rather, you know, kill the disease at its um, when it's just beginning or prevent it from happening at all rather than um, treating it at its end stages. Um, but the problem with that is that um, a lot of its impact is seen in the long run, which is why there's some hesitation to reallocate funding from health expenditure to health promotion um, and early intervention and prevention. Um, this is because this long term that we talk about um, is usually about 10 or 20 years down the track. So you can't see it immediately the way you can see the immediate effects of um, health expenditure. And before we end part two of the PDHPE mini lecture, we are going to do one more question um, about consumers considering um, like the questions that they need to consider before choosing complementary and or alternative healthcare approaches. So this is another um, really easy question to get through, only four marks, and here we go. So consumers should consider the products being offered and, the re and research what it is designed to treat or cure, as well as its potential side effects. They should also research its effectiveness, determining if the service or product has been successful for people who have experienced this complementary or alternative approach. So you know, this could be um, a chiropractor, acupuncture, naturopathy, um, all of those. Consumers also need to ensure that the practitioner providing the service has the appropriate experience and training to deliver it safely and effectively. At the same time, consumers should consider how much it costs and determine if it is an affordable service or product. Um, to make it really easy for you, um, the main points of it are highlighted in blue. So what is the product or service being offered? Um, is it effective? Has it been successful? then the health practitioner's experience and training, and then how much it costs. All right, thank you for tuning in to part two of PDHPE, um, and we're going to follow on call one and do the Ottawa Charter in part three.